Hey everyone, this is Judy Warner with Altium's On Track Podcast. Thanks for joining us again. I appreciate everyone that's following. We are spreading like wildfire and we thank you for all your comments and opinions and we always look forward to hearing about things you want to hear from. So reach out to us on Twitter. I'm at Altium Judy or you can connect with me on LinkedIn or Altium is on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. So today I have a longtime friend and ex-colleague, Jay Colonery, and um, Jay is the, the Director of Business Development at EIT, which is Electronic Instrumentation and Technology in Richmond, Virginia. And you're going to have fun just listening to Jay because it's like talking to Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> so for you girls out there, we're going to just have fun listening to Jay talk. Just kidding, but he does have a nice southern drawl. Um, so, Jay, thanks so much for joining us today, and we look forward to talking to you about DFA and um, some technical stuff today. So thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. This is an exciting time uh, at EIT. We just added on Altium capability, and so I'm delighted to get the word out, and what better way to do it than talking to you. Well, you know, when you suck up to your friends at Altium, you get on a <laughs> podcast. That's how it works yeah. around here. Great. So, Jay, why don't you start out by telling our listeners a little bit about your educational background and your professional background, sort oh, of st set the stage for us. Okay, sure. I, I uh, picked up a double E degree at Virginia Tech and then a master's in double E at the University of Virginia. So you could say I'm a son of Virginia for sure. <laughs> I managed to spend most of my career here in the Mid-Atlantic. And uh, my career spans from board level uh, elect electronic design to integrated circuits. VLSI design, and then kind of jumped over to the other side of the table and became an applications engineer uh, doing custom uh, microelectronics and um, had a few years running a rep firm, making some commissions along the way, and uh, then ended up in the printed circuit board business working for DDI and Via Systems, now TTM. And one of my customers was a company called Zentec, which was an electronic manufacturing services company, and I went to work for them, and now I work for EIT who is also situated in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, I do want to correct one thing you mentioned. I live in Richmond, Virginia, but EIT oh. is based in Leesburg, Virginia, okay. with two other facilities. So okay. we can talk some more about that. All right. Thanks for correcting me there. So with all that variety of background, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are now and about EIT and okay. what their expertise is and what kind of technology mix they handle and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so I joined EIT back in March. Very happy to be there. This is a company that's uh, in its 42nd year of wow. providing, yeah, engineering services, uh, which then led to man electronic manufacturing services. So we do both engineering very much in our DNA. We hmm. consider our engineering value add to be an important part of most of our customer relationships. So, um, uh, you know, the, the thing about being in the electronic manufacturing service is that it's kind of a commodity when you look at it from the standpoint of just picking and placing parts with machines. Right. Uh, so, so we're looking to engage customers at additional levels, including engineering, um, uh, turnkey builds, turnkey testing solutions of all manner, um, box build if necessary, demand fulfillment, soup to nuts, um, so that we're doing more than just using those machines. And EIT has three facilities uh, okay. along the East Coast. Uh, altogether, we have over 200,000 square feet of brick and mortar, which makes us wow. pretty big for a small company. Uh, we have a facility in Danville, Virginia, not, our headquarters in Leesburg, and then another in Salem, New Hampshire. Um, altogether, I've got eight surface mount lines to keep busy. Uh, <laughs> Danville is what uh, we designate as our low-cost center of excellence. It's also a 100% vertically integrated location because it can do any kind of metal work, cabling, wire, box build. We have all that in place. It's a purpose-built facility to support the box builds, which we like to do for our customers. We don't do metal standalone, although occasionally I'll build a heat sink or something for somebody. Right. We tend to we tend to allocate that fa factory towards our customer box builds. Okay. And then Leesburg and 
Salem, New Hampshire, are, are high-tech facilities. They both have this latest state-of-the-art universal equipment, so we can back each other up if something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. And they both have a full suite of the latest and greatest in automated inspection technologies and, and a full suite of test capability. Wow, that sounds impressive. It's uh, a it's it's a it's a heck of a lot going on and a story that needs to get out. It's kind of been a a, a secret lately. Yeah, so I, kind of, I haven't yeah. heard of them. I'm I mean I'm on I'm on the left coast, of course, but I ha- I had not heard of them. But they sound like a really great um, facility with a really good going all the way from true engineering to, mm-hmm. to box builds. That's that's nice. Um. So, and we'll make sure to share the link, by the way, for any of you listeners who are looking for a good EMS um, or engineering service or whatever, we'll be sure to share that link on the uh, show notes. So Yeah, thanks. and pl- please do because we're launching a new website next week, so I want to get oh, to uh, okay. So hopefully the timing of that will work out. Okay. All right, good. We'll send you some traffic for your new website. So, yeah. um Jay, because of the breadth of your knowledge and experience and background, I thought it'd be great for our listeners today if you shared a few tips from, you know, being that you came from some of the largest board manufacturers and certainly in North America and almost the world, um, maybe three tips or so on bare boards and then a few on DFA to help okay. the designers in our audience and the engineers in our audience that that might want to learn a few tips and tricks from a pro. Okay. I, you know, I came up with a few of each. Uh, you know, really when you're looking to design a printed circuit board, you have two fundamental objectives. One, uh, to design it so that it uh, can be fabricated um, reliably and with high yields. Uh, and then two, so that it can be assembled. So there's mistakes that can be made that can affect uh, both key processes. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about PCB design issues that affect PCB fabrication and reliability. And, you know, none of these I think are going to be earth shattering, but it's interesting to see the same mistakes being made a lot over and over again. So we just kind of keep, we bang the drum and we hope everybody gets the message (laughs) sooner or later. So uh, I guess beginning with VIA and PAD, there's more and more VIA and PAD today Mm -hmm. uh, by necessity. And VM pad, in order to be done reliably, requires a wrap plating process. Mm-hmm. Uh, without getting into the specifics of what that does, it, it, what it, the purpose of it is it provides a reliable button around the VIA. Uh-huh. Uh, without the wrap plating process, it is an unreliable arrangement. But that requires the addition of more copper on the outer layers than you would see otherwise. And this uh, wrecks havoc with the uh, fine line design. So if you're at three mil mm. trace in space or below, you really can't tolerate that extra copper. So it requires right. planning up front. Understand if you're going to need wrap plating, and if so, maybe move those fine line geometries to the inner layers where that won't come into play. Okay. That makes sense. So, yeah. So, and, and it'll get you. I mean, you'll think your design's done, and then the next thing you know, your fabricator says, well, you know, you realize I've got to add this much copper to the outside, and, and now you're violating trace and space. I've seen so. this happen, too, when there's multiple on RF and microwave boards, too, when you have, uh, when you're doing sequential lamb or whatever, and you keep plating, plating, and, and people don't, when they do their simulations, don't add in that those right. outer layers are getting extra copper, too. So it really can Absolutely. throw you off. Right. All right, right, that's a good one. Um, here's another one that, you know, I'm, I'm told they're still seeing a lot of it in the market by the guys that I used to work with at DDI, and that is they'll, they'll see overlapping VIA structures where the designer has put a VIA from, say, level one and three and another one from level two to eight. That, that can't be made. Mm. Uh, they have to be stacked. They have to be sequential. They can't be overlapping. But believe it or not, we see it. So I've seen it many, many times. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, to be fair, sometimes when I look at those cords and figure out how they're going to be stacked up, it, you know, I get confused too. So, well, I mean, I, I'll say this again and again sit down with your PCB fabricator at the time you develop your stack up and your basic uh, via structure. And your basic via structure is going to be d- driven by the toughest part of the design. Maybe it's a BGA with a finer pitch than you've ever used before. Right. You're not even sure how to route it. 
you're probably going to have to stack some micro beers or at the very least have some blind or buried beers to get the job done. Um, sit down with the fabricator before you even start that router and make sure that everybody likes to stack up and that it looks manufacturable. Yep. Yeah. Soup, very sound yeah. advice. Yeah. Okay, that's another good one. Got yeah, I've got one, one, first? One, one more I want to talk about because this is happening more and more. You know, um, uh, all, this, all the designs are getting faster and faster. I mean, high-speed digital is now in the radio frequency. And um, FR4 is uh, just has too high a dielectric for most of the new designs now. So many PCB designers are going to have to work with materials they haven't worked with before. Yeah. Um, the more exotic, more expensive materials. And when you start talking about fabricating a PCB with Teflon versus FR4, you're talking about different processing altogether. So when you go to a new material, consult with your PCB guy as to which material would be suitable for the speed you're looking at and ask them, okay, have, what, how have the rules changed with that material? What are your limitations? And you can ask your EMS provider the same question because the Print Circuit Board is the foundation and upon all of our business, upon which all of our business is done. So we understand PCBs, but I think especially with materials, you want to talk to the fabricator. Yeah, it's true. And if when I worked for an RF and microwave shop once, I I told them I said, you know, sometimes when you see a piece of Teflon material and a piece of I don't know Rogers Forty Three Fifty. Until you strip the cuff off, you can't tell it's different. <laughs> but inside so, the board shop, that Teflon can turn into like bubble gum. It's yeah. not reinforced. But when you take the copper off and you go like this, it like flaps in the wind where <laughs> 4350 will remain rigid. So it kind of gives you a visual sense of this is radically different and the way that it processes inside the shop and how... The way it interacts with chemicals, moisture, heat. So it, it is yeah. true to the closer you can be when you go into those materials to your fabricator. Okay, those were three good ones. All right, good. how about DFA wisdom? Okay, well, um, one we see it quite often, uh, and I guess it's tempting for the designer to do this because he thinks he's kind of found a shortcut and a way to use less PCB area, but you see a lot of a uh, guy's trying to uh, use what we call common pads, and these are pads that are so close together that they touch, rather than routing a thin signal from pad to pad. So these pads do share the same signal, but we don't want them to physically share the same space. Oh. That causes us problems with controlling what the solder does once it flows. So, oh. uh, so, so keep those pads apart, and and run a uh, uh, just a a, a small. Uh, signal trace between them hmm. and then we'll let the solder mass do the rest and we can control the flow of the solder so that's a real simple one but we run into it a lot okay um, I talked before about via and pad uh, we see a lot of designs where people don't fill that via if the via is in the pad it's got to be filled and it must be plated over and planarized. Sometimes that's done properly. Sometimes it's not. There's a mm -hmm. little dimple there. Yep. If there's a dimple in that pad, and I place a BGA ball on top of that, gas is going to get trapped underneath the solder paste that I apply, and there will be a little air in that dimple. And heated gas expands. It expands ferociously. It doesn't want to stay where it is, and it will blow all the solder right out of the pad at reflow yep. time. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, I have customers argue with me against it. It is expensive to fill and planarize a via, but it, it's the right thing to do. You have to do it if you want reliable BGA connections. These are leadless parts that we can't inspect visually. Right. We have to use x-ray. Mm -hmm. It's not really practical to use 100% x-ray inspection, uh, except on high reliability applications like military, maybe medical. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we lot, we lot sample these BGAs uh, right. with the x-ray and if we don't see any problems with, with the lot then we we carry on uh, so I can't emphasize that enough um, uh, to uh, uh, to fill those vias and fill those vias properly and I would add further uh, that there's no point you know, we have some people that are using thermal vias uh, these are vias really who are designed not necessarily to conduct uh, an electrical uh, signal although they they do, but to conduct electricity from a hot part to maybe a ground mm -hmm. plane, might okay. be an inner layer or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you run into people who call out, oh, so, so there has to be a filling to fill those vias before they're 
plated over. Right. And there's two types of filling. There's conductive and there's Mm -hmm. non-conductive. I strongly recommend never to use conductive. Uh, Non-conductive is much less expensive. The benefit of using conductive fill from a thermal point of view is super minimal. I mean, oh, the copper is okay. doing all the work. Okay. And and if you need to draw to pull more current or more thermal energy, just create more thermal vias because the copper is doing all of the work. I mean, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, thermal conductivity is defined in watt meters. A typical V is going to give you over 600 watt meters of conduction. If you fill it with conductive fill, you only get six more watt meters. What's that what? compared to oh, 380? Yeah. I'm sorry, 380 is what the copper gives you. Okay. The, the non-conductive only has 0.6 watt meters, but the point is both of those are in the noise compared to what the copper's doing. Right. And last but not least, good luck trying to get a printed circuit board fabricated in China with conductive fill. They don't do it over there. Really? So, right. So, well, maybe somebody's doing it, but we're having a hard time finding it. Interesting. So, hmm. yeah. Why so, is that? Uh, because it's not, it's, it's they not don't so like it. It's it's they just, just they go, it's not important, so we're not doing I, it? <laughs> I don't think anybody should be doing it. Hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. It's too expensive for the return. Interesting. I'd never yeah. heard that before, actually. But it makes well, sense we, with those numbers. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. surprised it took root for a while. We cause... recommended as far back as five years ago, DDI, not to use conductive fill. Huh. I think it's a dinosaur and its day has come and gone. But there's probably some engineers out there right now going, no. <laughs> conductive. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, so. well, show me the data, yeah. you know. And when, when there's enough good research out there and data, people will stop doing it, I'm sure. Yeah. So, so uh, go you're ahead. breaking up a little bit. Can you go hear me ahead, okay? sorry. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, so along the lines of thermal vias, uh, here's another tip. Uh, a lot of times, a thermal via will be located in a big plane. Uh, so you'll have the via and the copper button around it will actually be in contact with the plane. This is a no-no. This makes it very hard to deal with the solder flow again. So what we ask our customers to do is do a sprocket arrangement around that thermal via button. Mm. And and so basically that button will exist. There'll be a gap between it and the plane around it. And then the sprockets are simply traces above, below, and the right and left. So it's, And that it's... It's an arrangement of a sprocket. Very good design practice, frequently missed. And uh, hmm. it's not unusual that we have to go back and retool the board to add those in order to make the, uh, especially uh, back planes with, with active components. Uh, you see a lot of that, and uh, they, they have to retool to add that feature to make it manufacturable. Well, these are good tips. You were <laughs> okay. concerned you didn't have good tips. I think these are really good tips, actually. Well, glad you do. I do. Not that I spend all my days you know pondering dfa these days but that's good um you know jay you and i worked together for a a small bit of time and something i've noticed over the years i I don't maybe five ten years is seems like there's been a migration of where more ems shops that i go into have pcb designers in their shop and not so much, I guess, fabricators, at least that I've noticed they may be there. Of course they do with larger shops. But why Why do you think that is and why do you think that's a good idea? Well, I think it's a great idea for both the customer and the EMS. Um, we, As I mentioned before, we want to do more for the customer than just assemble his circuit cards. Um, and if a customer, an Altium customer, finds themselves in a position where they need to outsource some of their design. Maybe they, you know, their, their designers are saturated. Maybe they just need the resources. What better place to do it than at uh, a guy that knows how to assemble the cards and really understands the issues mm. uh, about fabrication and about assembly. Your chances are that the design from your EMS provider is going to, going to go right through new product introduction without a hitch. 
Mm-hmm. Whereas if you do it internally and you're not aware of some of the issues, you can, you know, it won't go through it without a hitch. We may not catch the problem until it's too late, yeah. and you may see several tooling iterations, and yeah. and you'll see a delay. And and nobody wants a delay during new product introduction. Everybody's in a hurry right. to get their prototypes. So and nobody uh, wants think, to waste money because that's going right. to be expensive too. Yeah, but we think there's a lot of serendipity between. Uh, that particular engineering function and and getting to uh, what we all want, which is production of electronics. Well, that does make sense in that um, we both know Mike Brown, and Mike I trusted implicitly to know about fab and assembly, and Mm -hmm. he would catch all that stuff. So he did have a broader understanding than maybe somebody who just does, you know, has a consulting firm, say, um, that That's does right. designs because he's around it all the time, all day long. So uh, there's certainly a lot of exposure there. So that makes sense. Um, well, first of all, welcome to the All Team family. You told me recently that your designer um, onboarded All Team Designer 18. That's exciting mm-hmm. for us. So thank you for that. What made you? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go for a little. Uh, pat on the back for all team right here. But I want you to um, tell us why you, why EIT chose to to go all yeah. team designer over perhaps another tool. Okay, well we think uh, we think some of the key features of all team. First of all, it's an all inclusive package, so it's schematic capture and printed circuit board design. You don't have to worry about working with two different pieces of software. Mm-hmm. We like the fact that um, there's an ECAD MCAD interface, which makes it really easy for us to do three three d- dimensional fit models mm-hmm. uh, once we once we place the the, the uh, uh, components. Uh, we we love the room creation capability, which, as I understand it, allows you to take a previous design, a piece of it, and then just kind of cut and paste it right yeah. into your new design. Yeah. yeah, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I think that's that's pretty strong. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, very solid uh, DFM rules capability uh, that, uh, you know, is really going to help us get to where we need to be. I mean, the fact is... These boards need to be designed to IPC standards, and the, the the fabricators have tailored their process to meet these standards. And when you send them something that's outside those bounds, um, the mechanism sort of locks up; it just doesn't work. You, you'll get a no <laughs> bid, or you know, bells will go off. So, right. So that so those design design rules are, are critical, and and that you have the ability to set them up in advance is a nice piece of insurance. So, and I I think it's a reasonably priced tool compared to the other high-end tools as well so we're we're pleased to have it good well thank you again we're happy to have you on board and i'll needle you later about sending your designer to alt team live because we're going to have a really good conference with some good training coming up so so your designer will probably enjoy going if you guys have the time and budget to do that well, keep us keep me posted when, I will. when and where. I okay. will. It's coming up in October. So, Jay, we're kind of wrapping up here, but um, if you've listened to these podcasts before, you'll know that sometimes I like to ask designers or engineers like yourself what you like to do after hours, and we call this portion of the podcast Designers After Hours. So okay. I know you have a couple interesting hobbies, so... Why don't you tell those to our listeners? Because I think they're kind of fun. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, 10 days in Montana and Wyoming this September. I'm a big hiker. uh, And nothing is more fun than hiking up in the the beautiful Rocky Mountains. So we're going to... Uh, we're going to hit three national parks. We're going to do about two to six hours of hiking a day, or as much as my legs can give me, <laughs> and uh, just have a, just an awesome lifetime outdoor experience, and hopefully not run into uh, a grizzly bear on, along the way. <laughs> but my wife's really worried about that, by the way. So uh, <laughs> bring your grizzly repellent. <laughs> yeah, and and then I know you wanted me to talk about one other thing. Um, my favorite. As you, yeah, as you know, uh, we we business development types are um, uh, very competitive and yeah. 
Yeah, and what better uh, setting to compete against each other than uh, in a uh, you know in a pub throwing some darts? So I've been a dart player since I was 19 and took it very seriously for a while and spent way too much time on it. Actually, uh, traveled uh, every weekend to tournaments all around the United States and played in a couple of U.S. Opens. But that was a long time ago. Now I just play for fun on Monday nights. That cracks me up. You were the one and only like competitive, like traveling dart player that I know. Okay, but my favorite part is tell tell about the beer to success ratio of a good dart player. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So so we're throwing a twenty seven gram projectile at a target about the size of a dime, and uh, turns out that if you get nervous or you try too hard, you're not going to be very successful at that. So it turns out that that second or third beer really kind of smooths out your stroke, and you generally <laughs> shoot a little bit better. At least at least that's what we rationalize. <laughs> and what happens if you go over three? Yeah, that's uh, that's a slippery slope indeed. You've got to be careful. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, that was like one of my favorite, I think, designer after hour hobbies yet. So well, thank, I, when, thank, when I come out, we'll find a we'll find a place and throw throw a few. Okay, all right. I'll get my three beers ready. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, for me, I'd be like half a beer, like three beers. You'd be putting me in an Uber and sending me home. <laughs> I'm a wimp. So Jay, thanks so much for your time. These have been great um, tips, and it's good to see your face, my friend, and I wish you all the success at EIT, and we will certainly share all the links in the show notes, and um, we'll also put the link to Altium Live and in, in, in the show notes, and we'll encourage your designer to come out and join us as one of the new newbies to the Altium family, so we'll include that as well. So thanks again for joining, and um, we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you, Judy. It was my pleasure. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. Again, this has been Judy Warner with the Altium On Track podcast and Jay Colonery from EIT. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, always stay on track. 